Tasting Tales Flower. Tonight we're going to be talking about the Pinot Noir varietal. It's the perfect complement for most Thanksgiving menus. And on behalf of the Bryan Alumni Association, I'd like to welcome you this evening or this afternoon, like our host this evening, who's out on the West Coast. My name is Kathleen Brown, and I'm the Senior Associate Director of the Alumni Parent Engagement Office. So I see that you have your glasses at the ready. So yes, please enjoy tasting what you brought to, to this Zoom session. And um, then we'll lead us through an exploration and comparison of Pinot Noir grape from regions all around the world, including Burgundy, France, Oregon, a couple areas of California, Australia, New Zealand, Chile, and Argentina. And of course, we'll want to hear about, about um, the regions that you might have brought to the evening as well. For those of you who have not had a chance to meet Vin, he is a Bryant graduate from the class of 1988, a marketing major, and a member of our National Alumni Council. Vin is the Director of Advanced Planning, Advanced Markets at Prudential Financial. Now, I would have to tell you that Vin is a true Renaissance man. In addition to his MBA, he has 10 additional professional certifications. But he doesn't just collect knowledge, he enthusiastically shares it. He has turned one of his passions and interest in learning into Vin de Vin wine tasting consultants and collecting. It's a business dedicated to wine education and wine tasting for businesses, individuals, and organizations that are fun, interesting, and well, tasty. Before I turn the program over to Vin, I'd like to provide you with some tips for tonight's Zoom event. I think many of you have been spending a lot of time on Zoom, so this is probably old hat for you, but um, Meg, my colleague Meg Cummins, is going to make sure everyone is muted while Vin gives his presentation. Um, you know that you can pop in with some questions on the chat feature. The chat's located at the bottom of your screen. I think Vin probably will find some moments throughout his presentation to reach out to you with some questions. So he'll either ask you to visually um, uh, indicate that you're you're ready to answer, or he may direct you to, to put your answer in the chat. Um, once his presentation is done, we'll unmute everyone officially and let people um, have you know nice free flow conversation. Uh, we're all excited to hear about some of your favorite Thanksgiving sides, Thanksgiving traditions and here are some of the, your thoughts about the wines you, you brought this evening. So uh, without any further ado, I give you Ben. Thank you so much. Unmute and Our, our presentation. Can everyone hear me okay? Can everyone hear me? All right. Okay. Just can anyone just verbally say uh, if they can hear me? We can hear you. Okay, good. Sorry. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Kathleen. Uh, thank you for the alumni to the online alumni office, including uh, Meg Cummins, uh, Robin Ward, uh, Jessica Dang, on all of you. Um, hopefully we'll have a fun time tonight. Uh, as Kathleen said, uh, Thanksgiving is upon us. And uh, it, to me, it's one of my favorite, if not the most favorite holiday, uh, mainly because um, it's, it's about family. And I have a lot of great memories about um, uh, being at Bryant and looking forward to Thanksgiving. Um, and uh, just just the anticipation just got me excited. The food, the family, um, you know, as a college student, I couldn't buy gifts for Christmas, so Thanksgiving was more up my alley. Um, so, uh, and this year, obviously, it's, it's, it's especially uh, kind of, I think, poignant because we're not able to get together with folks. So I appreciate you making the time to, uh, to join us today. Um, as Kathleen said, I live in uh, Oregon. And so for those of you, I had to learn this, Oregon means that, you've, um, that you know how to pronounce Oregon. Oregon means that you're from out of town. So, uh, so Oregon, I had, to, I had to learn that myself. Um, and so let, let's get right into it. Um, 
in true Bryant fashion, I started working with Jess on this PowerPoint. And initially it said agenda here, but I think I figured more like menu. Agenda would definitely be Bryant speak, right? Um, but I figured let's, what's, what's on our menu today? So we're going to talk about um, Pinot Noir. Um, we're going to talk about the grape and what's the fascination with it. We're also going to talk about, um, you know, uh, where it's primarily uh, grown. Um, Kathleen alluded to that. Um, and what are the kind of aromas, colors, and tastes associated with Pinot Noir? Why is it such a, you know, captivating and popular wine? I think it's been probably America's most popular wine since uh, since at least Sideways. So clearly, um, you know, uh, that's been, uh, what, 15, 17 years now. Um, it's It's been really kind of the red wine of, of choice for ma many Americans. Well, we're going to talk about Pinot Noir and Thanksgiving food pairing. And as Kathleen said, we'll be uh, kind of socializing at the end. And I, I would really like you all to, um, to, you know, to type in the chat when you can. Uh, if you'd like to unmute, uh, I believe there's a, a mechanism for you to do that. Unmute yourself, ask a question. I want it to be as interactive as possible. And um, so with that, uh, let's get right into it. So uh, Jess and Meg were nice enough to put some images of, uh, of, of Thanksgiving. And um, golly gee, I mean, you know, it just, uh, it's hard to believe it's uh, a week from today. Um, and um, yesterday I bought a blueberry pie because that's my favorite, but there were pecan pies and pumpkin pies. And, and of course, you've got your turkey. Um, I think part of the reason why, um, you know, wine is such a, you know, a, a staple associated with Thanksgiving is because there's just so many dishes it isn't as though it's one dish, right? Thanksgiving has many dishes. It's turkey. Um, it's, uh, you know, uh, sweet potatoes. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, some people have um, different types, like fried, grilled. You've got the whole turducken phase that uh, people have. Different kinds of stuffing. Is it stuffed inside? Is it stuffed outside? Cranberry sauce, raisins. Mashed potatoes. I mean, there's as many dishes. And so is there one wine that goes with everything? Well, you know, probably not, but certainly Pinot Noir is up there. And I'll, we'll talk a little bit about why Pinot Noir goes with Thanksgiving. Um, we'll go, get right into that. And again, feel free to ask any questions or if you would like to unmute, uh, by all means do so. We'll, we'll try to make this as interactive as possible. So as you know, I live in Oregon. And I'm originally from Connecticut, which is not a Pinot Noir country, <laughs> Eastern Connecticut, that is. Uh, but in Oregon, you know, um, it, you talk to Oregonians, particularly in the Willamette Valley, where most of the wineries that make Pinot Noir are, they might tell you that, you know, Pinot Noir's ancestral homeland is Oregon. But that's not the case. We all know, or we should know, uh, that Burgundy, France, is the ancestral home of Pinot Noir. So on this list, which uh, you should have received by email, are just some suggestions. If you didn't get any of these wines, that is fine. I mean, we have to be realistic here. I believe there's over 400 wineries in Burgundy that just dedicated to Pinot Noir. Um, and in, in Oregon, it's probably closer to 300, or it's growing by the day. In California, there's well over 500. So, uh, you know, to say I want to recommend five or six, it's, it's hard. But these are some of the ones that you might run into. I tried to make the list so that they're wines that you could find in the Northeast. Um, and so if you did it, that's fine because you'll probably, if you opened up a, a bottle or two of these, you'll notice um, there's some similarities, but there's probably some differences. And we'll talk about why there's differences. But as you can tell, Pinot Noir has grown all over the world. Um, and uh, of course, Burgundy, as we said, the ancestral homeland, Oregon, um, California, particularly in the cooler areas like the Russian River Valley, on Sonoma, um, the Santa Rita Hills, any of those cooler spots in California, uh, some of them are coastal, some of them are, are some of the mountains and hills um, in the interior. Um, you typically won't find it in the warmest areas of California, um, and we'll talk about why in a moment, uh, but you'll find it in Argentina. It's often grown at higher elevations in the Andes, as you will find in Chile as well. Uh, in Australia, it's, it's in the cooler climate areas, not in the hotter climate areas. 
And of course, New Zealand has really become a very popular Pinot Noir producing country. Um, they're probably more well known for Sauvignon Blanc, but um, Pinot Noir is every bit as popular and affordable as, um, as Pinot Noir in, in other places. So that's, that was the list that was sent out to you. Hopefully uh, you got something along those lines. I know the McGee family got three bottles alone. Um, so I think they're going to be doing a, 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 a tasting of, of three different bottles tonight from three different regions. So hopefully some of you got one at least and maybe even more um, bottles than that you can compare. So what's the fascination with Pinot Noir? And please enjoy the wine. It goes without saying um, you should be drinking and maybe nibbling on some food as we're going through this. I've got some cheese. I've got some, um, uh, some provolone and also some manchego. I've got some crackers and bread from Bourson. And, um, and I've got some sopracetta here. So um, some nice uh, finger foods. Um, so hopefully you're drinking and you're eating a little bit as we go along. Um, so what's the fascination? What's the big deal about the Pinot Noir grape? Well, I want to look at it from two views. One is, you know, why do people grow it? And, you know, why is it kind of this, this grape that seems to have this cult-like following? And then we're going to talk about kind of the flavors and the aromas and the taste. And they're, they are linked. The grape itself is small and thin-skinned. Um, and that means it's sensitive to heat, meaning, you know, it, it can burn easily. Um, and, you know, too much heat. Um, you know, means that you could actually destroy your crop. Um, uh, and of course, with global warming, we're seeing more and more of this. Um, now, too little heat uh, leads to underripe and underdeveloped grapes. So think sun is okay, heat not so okay. Now, rain is not obviously not so good. Here in Oregon, the biggest issue used to be, you know, rain, because people think of the Pacific Northwest as rainy all the time. But as you saw over the summer, we've had record heat to the point this year where we had some of the problems that California is having, which is widespread uh, drought and fires. And primarily that's because we don't get enough rain um, uh, in the uh, mountains and in the rivers during the uh, winter and spring. And then of course the summer, it's just completely dry and there is no, no uh, rain at all. So um, it is important where you plant Pinot Noir. If you plant it in the desert or someplace completely hot, um, it would not thrive. Um, it would burn and you wouldn't be able to get the kind of wine that you'd want. And of course, you'd lose money. And so it prefers cooler uh, to, te uh, to temperate climates, not really hot climates. Uh, and I would contrast that, say, with Cabernet Sauvignon, which is, you know, more of a, a hot weather grape or Syrah is a more hot weather grape. So you could grow it in much hotter climates. But the Pinot Noir prefers the cooler temperate climates. It does uh, bud early in the growing season, meaning, you know, it, it starts its actual process of growing fairly early here in the Northern Hemisphere. That would be somewhere around April or May. It starts to bud. You get the, what they call the bud break. Um, and you can imagine, again, if it's really rainy um, or there's not a lot of sunlight, then the bud break is later. And that means that you need more days of sunlight before the grapes are ready to pick. Now, with that said, Pinot Noir yields are typically low, and that's because uh, they're small bunched uh, grapes, so you don't get as much juice from a Pinot Noir, um, you know, bunch, uh, a bundle of grapes as you would, say, a larger grape like Syrah, Merlot, or uh, Cabernet. Um, and, of course, it, it, they're packed bunches, and so sometimes you get underripe grapes in there. Imagine kind of a cluster that has a bunch of grapes in it. Some of them that got more heat exposure will be, um, will be ready um, to be picked. Some of them on the interior maybe may not be because they didn't get the sunlight. So they do this thing called pruning, who you, who you may have heard of, where they kind of cut the leaves back a little bit to try to get more sun exposure to the vine itself. But as all of your business people probably on this call, Bryant background, you know, when you add all this up, it's an expensive wine to produce. I mean, forgetting things like labor, which, you know, um, Pinot Noir is not a grape that is um, typically machine harvested, it's hand harvested. Um, and so you add all these factors together and it's more and a more expensive wine to produce. Many of you probably know there aren't many great Pinot Noirs that are say under $15. 
Um, there are some good ones, but you know the, the great ones are probably closer to 25, 30, 40. And if, when you get into the burgundy range, you could pay easily you know, $100 or more a bottle. Um, so it, it is an expensive wine uh, to produce. So what's the fascination? Well, one of the fascinations is the fact that is that um, it's it's one of these wines that because it's so popular around the world for its complexity, nuance, um, frankly, there's some people that are just addicted to Pinot Noir. That's all they will drink. Um, and so because of that, and because you can charge a decent price for Pinot Noir, it's one of those ones where people, uh, winemakers and consumers, find it very popular wine to make and to drink. So what I'd like to do is, is take a moment and um, have all of us kind of stick our nose in a glass. I'm going to stop sharing for a moment here and have us kind of take your wine glass and swirl it all around and stick your nose in and tell me what you smell. And you can either type it in the chat or if you want to unmute. What do we smell? Let's see what we got in the chat here. Uh, pape, pepper? Pepper, I didn't type quick enough. I'm gonna type too quick. <laughs> we'll excuse that, Kathleen. There's no, there's no spell check on chat. <laughs> Black currant, very nice, Doug, yeah. Now, one of the reasons why the aroma people feel is kind of um, this kind of earthy, is because of those thin skins, it tends to absorb the earth around it. Some people would even say it smells like a barnyard. Um, you know, you might get really like funky type of aromas, um, almost making you think, well, gee, am I gonna drink this? I mean, it almost smells like I shouldn't be drinking it. But that's part of the allure. It has this kind of earthy, um, kind of wilted roses, you sometimes get some herbs. It's not like it's you smell like strawberries or you smell, you know, blackberries, something more in your face. Uh, I think it's a little bit more nuanced, um, again, more earthy. Um, sometimes uh, Pinot Noir can be like lighter or simpler because um, maybe it's, it's mass produced. And we'll talk about that in a moment, why some Pinot Noirs are like more jammy. Maybe some are more muted. Um, a lot of it does have to do with how you're making it and where you're making it. Is it mass produced or is it more site specific? Um, but that funky barnyard thing is fairly common. Um, now, we talked about this last time, but for those of you that, that didn't join us, you know, one of the things you can tell about Pinot Noir is that generally speaking, it's a lighter colored wine. Now, most of you have a Pinot Noir like I do. And if you look at it, you kind of hold it up to the light. It might be dark, and you might not be able to see through the bottom, but the top part of it, you should be able, it should be somewhat translucent, right? It's not completely black like, say, a darker wine would be. So I have two wines here. I've got a, um, a Santa Barbara Pinot, and I've got a Portland area Oregon. And the Oregon one looks to be lighter. Now, there could be many reasons for that, but one could be, you know, one wine's older than the other, um, and so typically older red wines will lose color. But all things being equal, Pinot Noir isn't going to be a dark kind of black color. So it's going to be that kind of that reddish purple. But also you've got the legs going on uh, or tears. So I want you all to swirl around and then tip your glass and tell me if you see those tears coming down the side. Yeah, see Newell, I see you see those, right? So those tears or legs are indications of alcohol level. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that alcohol is good or bad. It just means that, you, you know, it, it's the heaviness or the weight of the wine. If you were to have wider or thicker legs, that would typically mean that it's higher alcohol. So most Pinot Noirs are going to be probably between 12 and 15 percent uh, alcohol. So the particular one that I have here, which is a, a Loring Wine Company, which is in uh, Santa Rita Hills, uh, Central California. This one is 14.3%. And um, you may know this, but if you don't, the wineries get to adjust um, the alcohol level 50 basis points higher or lower. 
So, you know, this wine could be 14.8 or it could um, be, um, uh, it could be, you know, 50 basis point higher would make it 14.8, 50 basis point lower, we'll put it at um, uh, four, would be 13.5, uh, 13.8, excuse me. So 13.8 to 15.8, roughly at 10 basis points, five up or five, 50 basis points below or 50 basis above. But 14.3. On the port, the other one I have, Portlandia, this one's 13 and a half. So clearly, um, you know, less alcohol, that might be an explanation why this one is just a little bit lighter than that one. You might be able to see that on the screen. But again, the color doesn't necessarily tell you if it's good or bad, nor do, do the legs. Um, I mean, unless you're interested in high alcohol wines, and I know some of you are Bryant grads, so higher alcohol wines do, do appeal to you. Uh, but um, frankly, you know, more alcohol doesn't necessarily mean it's a good wine. As a matter of fact, there's been a movement in the U.S. away from higher alcohol wines, make them more balanced. And so you're seeing less of the higher alcohol. At one point, probably in the 90s and 2000s, you saw some Pinot Noirs that were like 15% or higher. Um, but again, the alcohol, if it's perceptible, that's not a good thing. The winemakers want you to feel that the wine tastes balanced and the alcohol should not be something that is right up front. Um, so in terms of flavors, we talked about that a little bit, cherry and spice. Um, we made to black pepper, um, black cherry, uh, great. Um, one of the things that... Um, is a big debate in the wine world is, you know, how fruity should a wine be, particularly a Pinot Noir. And a lot of that has to do with how ripe the grape is. So let's say all of us on this call, we were farmers or, you know, grape growers. And, you know, the summertime comes, say August is kind of closing, getting into September. Now it's time for us to pick. Well, we'd be out there checking the grapes to see, are the grapes developed? Um, there's different tools they can use. They can obviously, some of them are more, um, scientific than others. Some of them, it's just as easy as a winemaker taking a bite of one of the grapes and they can tell it has it developed uh, what they call phenolic phenolically, meaning it's developed to the point where they're ready to pick. Um, so if you wanted a wine with more alcohol, perhaps you would pick later, right? Because it would be a more developed grape with higher, grape with higher sugar. And the sugar is really what determines the alcohol because once the wine starts to ferment, the alcohol is, uh, the sugar is changed into alcohol, right? That's the whole fermentation process. They introduce a yeast or they have natural yeast and it goes from, you know, grape juice, right, um, to wine. And that change is through the fermentation of the sugar into alcohol. Now, if we wanted a lower alcohol wine, we would maybe pick it a little earlier, right? Because we'd have a, we want a grape that didn't have as much sugar in it. And so therefore, uh, it'd be, it would make a wine with a little less alcohol. So if, again, if we were all winemakers, you know, some of you might say, well, our customers like a higher alcohol or maybe a fuller wine or maybe a, a wine with a little more body. Well, then you, you'd probably uh, pick it a little bit later. Those of us that might say, listen, I want it a little bit lighter, a little more Burgundian, which is kind of the French way, a little more reserved, um, then you would pick it a little earlier. Now, the, the major issue is weather. Right. Because if I want to pick later and all of a sudden, you know, next week I'm planning on picking and then we get a rain or hailstorm. Guess what? I'm in trouble. Or this year was the fires. The fires hit September 7th in Oregon. So if you picked around there, you were OK. If you picked a little bit later, you could have some issues. Now, there weren't that many wineries burned in Oregon, unlike California, but there was some smoke in the air. And many of you saw those pictures. And so sometimes that smoke can influence um, the development of the grape. In September, largely the grapes are ready to be picked. So I think the effect would be is more muted here in Oregon um, because the most folks would start picking in September anyway. And that's when the fires hit. But um, in other places like California, the fires started much earlier. And of course, that affects um, the grape development. So with that, I want to just take a moment, see if there's any questions so far. The three um, sampling, Santa Rita Hills, uh, there's the Chilean and the New Zealand from Kathleen. Perfect. And I have a picture of those two, Kathleen, for everyone to, for everyone to see. So I'd be interested in knowing, Kathleen, what the differences you're having. And so as you get into it, you know, feel free to, to, to type in all of you, if you've got two different ones or three, um, you know, it'd be interesting to know what the difference is, both from a color perspective 
And from a taste perspective, and maybe even from an aroma perspective, um, if there's any differences. Then I can, I'll, I'll speak up about mine, if that's okay. Of course. Um, so we're sampling four wines tonight. I didn't say that very well, did I? <laughs> <laughs> Freudian, something Freudian about that. We've been sampling since 5.30 now. So there, I, have, I have two French wines, which I actually like the best, don't you? What yes, do you I do. Yeah. yeah, they are smooth. Um, I see they're slightly lower alcohol, which is just fine. Uh, we're sitting in front of the fire. We're eating uh, Brie and uh, Baby Swiss. Uh, but they are, they're really nice wines. I recommend if anybody isn't trying the French to give it a try because they were under $20 each and one was a real steal. What was the one you got? Was it less than 16? 16. So they were not expensive. Um, I did not like the Australian one. I told my husband that it tasted like Sauvignon in red, Sauvignon Blanc, which I don't like. Um, it has a grapefruity flavor for me. Mm. Um, I did like the, we have, uh, let's see, you have Chile, right? I have Argentina. Argentina. It's from, so uh, it's from the southernmost part of Argentina. And, um, and the Australian one is from the southernmost part of Australia. And this Pinot Noir was nice too. And I'm sure it was pretty reasonable, right? Umberto, From Umberto Canal. Canal, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but that, um, so, but the, but by far the French, Bur the French, I'm saying Burgundy, uh, Burgundy, right? But, right. but Pinot Noir were, were, were my favorites of, of these. So is anybody else trying anything French? I'll mute. Let me see. Vivian, I'm so glad you're with us, Vivian. I should have said hello earlier. Vivian was with us at the Cambridge tasting all those years ago, Robin, uh, that 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 downpour of rain. I remember I had to change my shirt at the wine tasting because it was soaking wet. Hello, I don't hello. Hi, Vivian. So much, uh, so good to see you and hear you. I'll um. Let me see if I could figure out my my. Your camera. My camera it says hide self view. Let's see. Yeah. So yeah, Ben, I was just uh, reminding Newell that we had had that tasting in Cambridge. That was a long time ago, though. How long ago? That was, that? it was, it was a great time at that Italian place. Jim was there um, and Amy was there and we had a good crowd for that. And uh, but Italian? I, I didn't think it was Italian. I think it was an Italian restaurant, wasn't it, Robin? It was definitely ethnic. I, I thought it was... It had brick walls. That's all I remember. Yeah. 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 I believe it was Italian. Well, I know it was Italian because as soon as Robin got the bill, she said, oh, mamma mia. <laughs> she looked at that bill and she was about to pass out. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, well, Vivian, you'll have plenty of time to, to turn on your, um, your, your camera, but I'm so glad you're here because I remember uh, that wine tasting with a lot of fond memories. Um, one of many that we did in person, and hopefully we'll do more in person um, in the in the not too distant future. That would um, be great. Um, so, so we, we've got a firm handle, right? Everyone knows, okay, Peter Noir. Uh, we know a little bit about how it's grown. We know now about you know a bit about why it costs the way it, you know, the amount of money, um, the price. Um, we know that it's got this kind of complexity and nuance to it. Um, there are differences, as Robin pointed out. I mean, you know, it's not only just a country, right? We can't say all Chilean Pinot Noirs are, aren't great or Australian. Obviously, if we spend more money, we're going to get a better quality Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir in general. Um, but they do have some common characteristics. But as we're going to learn in a moment, um, they do differ by where it's grown. And so um, not only what country, what region, but all the way down to the plot of land. Um, there are some uh, pieces of land that Pinot Noir just has historically excelled based on thousands of years of wine tradition and others that are not um, as, as, as good. A lot of it has to do with soil. Uh, and of course, you've got the sun and the wind um, and other factors which uh, the Europeans tend to uh, call terroir, 
which is kind of the whole ecosystem around um, uh, a particular uh, vineyard. So let's kind of move on and talk a little bit about those aromas. You may have seen this before. This is the wine aroma wheel. This was developed by Dr. Ann Noble uh, of the University of California at Davis, which is the leading wine university. They're kind of the Bryant of the wine uh, education world. Uh, we'll, we'll put a little plug in there for Bryant there. So uh, UC Davis um, has probably the leading wine education program in the United States. And she developed this wine roll wheel. It might be hard to see, but sometimes when people say, hey, a wine is fruity, what does that mean? And so here you've got different kinds of fruit, right? You've got your citrus, you've got your berries, tr tropical fruit and tree fruits. So, you know, you can get in. So when someone says fruity, as you said, Robin, it could be grapefruit. But other people might say, hey, it's more blackberry or black currant. I think that was one of the ones that was mentioned. Or some people will say, gee, you know, it tastes woody. Well, you know, we know that many wines are aged in wood. But what does that mean? Does it mean it's smoky? Or does it mean it's more, you know, vanilla or cedar? And so this is kind of where you kind of peel back the onion, so to speak, and get more into those exact flavors. Now, I don't expect you know, all of us to be walking around, you know, just using these, these uh, descriptors, um, you know, because I think sometimes, you know, uh, it is a wine that maybe we're trying to put our finger on and we don't exactly know what adjective to use. But this particular wine aroma wheel I find helpful when I'm teaching classes because it helps people understand what they're tasting. And matter of fact, and some of you may have taken some wine classes either through your local wine shop or maybe through an educational organization. Well, they'll actually put little bits of these actual um, things into like little um, cups and you'll smell um, all these different things around here so that you can actually develop your nose, get, develop your sense of smell and aroma. Some real high-end um, wine professionals don't even need to taste the wine in order to know what it is. They'll smell it and they'll be able to tell. Like for example, I can smell bacon and I know for sure that it's bacon. I don't know what kind of wine it is, but I know it's bacon. Um, so that's an example, probably a bad example, but the point here is uh, if you really, if your nose is really good and your aroma, sense of aroma is really good, you can actually, you know, determine what wine you're smelling. And Pinot Noir has that classic earth and barnyard. So you're going to find, you know, dark fruit, you know, like a you know, blackberry, black currant, but you're definitely not going to, you know, get, you know, pineapple, you're not going to get banana, um, you know, you're, you're not going to get some of these kind of more white fruits like uh, peach and apple. Um, and, and the same thing on the woody side. You may get some woody, but, you know, you know, does it range more medicinal? For most people, Pinot Noir, if it has any woody at all, it's going to be kind of the lighter wood um, and not the over-the-top wood like you would maybe get with a, maybe a Cabernet or a Chardonnay. So aromas are important in wine. Um, sometimes you can even get a, this chemical development or, uh, or an off wine. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, uh, Robin, with the wine that you have that smells great food, you know, it, it, that either is the wine or that um, it, it could be a defect. And sometimes people will refer to a wine that, uh, that it has a defect um, and it's either uh, because there's been too much exposure through the, through the uh, cork um, or there was some defect um, in the winemaking process. So the only way to really know is either to bring it back to your wine shop or taste another bottle. Um, so just something to think about in terms of aroma. Then uh, uh, it, it tasted better after I had it with Brie. With Brie, okay, okay. <laughs> um, the, the initial taste was a little bit sour, but not bad. Well, you know, that, that's one of the things that's really um, interesting about wine is how do you know when a wine is bad and when it's not? And we're not going to go into a lot of uh, depth today, but typically if a wine is off, um, you can, um, as I said, um, you know, have it with something else, um, you know, let it breathe a little bit. Um, as you did, Kathleen, and have it with some food. But if it truly feels off, um, then you're you're probably better bringing it back to the shop and having them uh, having it tasted. And you have wines once in a while that 
you know, that it has, you know, it's just gone bad for one reason or the other. Um, if it's a newer wine, it's usually uh, due to production. And uh, whereas an older wine, it could have kind of lost, um, it could have lost some of its flavor over time. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, France and where Burgundy came. Here's France and here's Burgundy right here, right? Um, so it is southwest of Paris. Uh, Lyon is right over here, uh, kind of just north and uh, of the Burgundy and just a little bit um, east of Chablis, um, uh, which is the kind of white Burgundy area. But right here, you've got Burgundy. Um, and then over here, you've got the blow up of Burgundy. Just did a nice job here. At the top, you have Dijon, which is probably France's biggest food town. I guess some people would probably consider the equivalent in U.S. might be, I don't know, maybe Chicago, maybe New York. Um, I would say are you know, probably the, the biggest food towns, maybe San Francisco. But Dijon is considered where all the great chefs have come from. Um, and, um, and so as you move south, you've got these um, different Burgundy regions, like sub-regions. And so um, these will often appear on the label of your, um, of your French bottle of wine. And there are actually sub, more sub-appellations like vineyard specific within these. So you might have a wine that says Cote de Nuit on it, but within that it might say, you know, vineyard, you know, Sarah's vineyard or, you know, the French version of Sarah's vineyard. So the important thing in Burgundy is that there are only two grapes that are allowed predominantly to be grown. The red wine grape is Pinot Noir and the white wine grape is uh, Chardonnay. And that's one of the reasons why I think some Americans have difficulty with buying Burgundy because number one, they're not sure what's in the bottle. So let's clear it up today. If it's a red wine and it says Burgundy on it or Bourgogne, right, which is the French word for Burgundy, it's, if it's red, it's going to be predominantly Pinot Noir. And I say predominantly because usually it's 100%, but in many cases, they, they'll let it be as low as 80% um, depending on the quality and the level of the wine. But for all intents and purposes, it is all Pinot Noir, if it is a red wine and it says Burgundy on the label, or of course says any of these regions. If it's a white wine and it says Burgundy on it, then it's going to be predominantly Chardonnay, uh, if not all Chardonnay. And the reason why they do that in Europe is they don't feel that they need to put the grape on the label, at least traditionally. Now you're seeing that change. So some of you have wine bottles tonight that are actually from Europe and the grape is on the front label. That's not common. As a matter of fact, as you go higher up into the levels uh, of wine uh, categorization in France, you lose the grape on the label. It won't say that. There was actually a time when it wasn't allowed. Now, because they want to obviously um, attract more consumers, more young people, uh, particularly in America and the English-speaking world, um, you, you know, the, some wineries have started to put the grape on the label, but the highest quality French Burgundy will not have the grape on the front label, because they feel that it's redundant to put Pinot Noir on the front when Pinot Noir is the only grape, the red grape allowed to be grown, right? It's redundant. In America and in the Western world, we put the grape on the front. So that's something to remember when you're talking about Burgundy. And that's true for other countries as well, as you probably know, we talked about last time, you know, Chianti, for example, in Italy is not a grape, it's a region. Bordeaux is not a grape, it's, it's a region. Um, even Germany across the border here from Strasbourg, they make Pinot Noir in the southern regions and they call it Spatbegunder. They don't even call it Pinot Noir. So every country is a little bit different, but for the most part, they don't put the grape on the front label, at least um, places like France and Italy, uh, Spain and Portugal. So uh, here you've got a typical French label Joseph Druin is the producer name. Just so happens his daughter, Veronique Druin, started a winery with her dad in 1987 here in Oregon. So for those of you that have been out here or you've drunk it, it's called Domaine Druin. That's the Oregon version of this wine. But in France, you've got the name of the winery. Bone is the village. We'll go back up here. And Bone is one of these villages. You see it right here, Bone. So we know that 
Bone is the village name. The vineyard name, uh, Clo Mouché. So that is a specific vineyard. Uh, I would say that's the equivalent of, say, a really nice vineyard, say, in Sonoma or Napa that grows the base, uh, the best wines, the best grapes. Uh, some of you might be familiar in California. There's in Napa, there's the Two Calon Vineyard, T-O space capital K-A-L-O-N. Uh, that's where Robert Mondavi and others make um, and produce some really world-class red wines, some of the most expensive in Napa Valley. That would be the equivalent. That's the vineyard. Um, and of course, you've got the Appalachian, or this is the region. So that would be the equivalent for us of, say, the Russian River Valley, the Willamette Valley, um, the Santa Rita Hills, very specific Appalachian. Um, so Appalachian Bone, uh, Premier Cru, which is their levels, um, bottled by. Um, we don't necessarily do that. Um, however, in the U.S., uh, you could have it bottled um, and it mean uh, estate bottled, meaning you grow all the grapes versus if you didn't have it bottled by, then it might mean you buy grapes from multiple producers. So here they just want you to know that Joseph Druin bottled these, not some other organization. Where are they located? You see Bur Burgundy or Burgonia in French and the alcohol content. On the right here, you see a classic, uh, you know, American or California label just so happens this is the wine I'm having tonight, which is the Loring Wine Company, their 2015 Pinot Noir, uh, the Close Pepe Vineyard. So that would be the equivalent of the Clo Mouché Vineyard, right? It's a very specific vineyard um, that the grapes are grown. It doesn't come from any other vineyard other than the Close Pepe Vineyard. And um, it's, of course, Pinot Noirs on the front label. I, I, I took a picture of the back label just for you, you're curious label here what doesn't say as much because this has all the information you need there might be some verbiage on the back but and it may even say pinot noir in the back but that um, is not mandatory on the back of an american wine label um there isn't there's usually a repeat of the uh information on the front the one thing that you can do on the front or the back of an american label is you can put the alcohol content and you see down here 14.3 percent you can have it in the front or the back the typical european wine will have it on the front um, but other than that, that's the difference. So when you go out and buy a French Burgundy, you have to know these regions, you know, um, and or just know that you're buying Pinot Noir. OK, um, so that's a little bit about the differences between French labels and Western labels. This would be true of Australia. This would be true of New Zealand, Chile, um, Argentina, all these other countries. And I happen to put a picture up of some of the wines. Um, this, I believe, is the McGee's wine. Um, you can see uh, Bourgogne, um, Bouchard, Pear, and Fils. Um, so that, I believe, is the Bouchard uh, family and children, right? Fils is children in French, kids. Um, and you've, now they have Bourgogne, Bur Bourgogne on the level, and they have Pinot Noir in the front. And the reason for that is that this is a classification. Um, think of it as almost levels. So the first level uh, is often known as vin de table or table wine, and that will typically allow you to put Pinot Noir on the label, on the front. But as you go up the label, you, you see a change. And I'm going to show you comparison here. You don't have Pinot Noir on the front label. Here you have it on the front label. Doesn't mean it's good or bad, but generally speaking, this bottle will cost you a bit more than the one that usually has the Pinot Noir on the front label. And because it's it's more site specific, it's a little um, it's 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 what the message the Burgundians want to send, and that is we have our you know we have different levels. So at maybe you know this price point, this is what we offer, and at this price point, we offer something even more specific. And then at the highest price point, we even have the best, you know, but of course you're gonna pay more for that. Here you have the Melville, which is a very well-known and highly regarded winery. Now, Kathleen, I believe went to school, Kathleen Brown went to school with this family. They're in central coast of California, if I'm not mistaken. Very highly rated wine uh, and wine family. They make Pinot Noir um, in California. Here you've got the Robin and Newell's Australian Pinot Noir. Again, Pinot Noir on the front label just as it was over here. Limestone Coast, we're gonna talk about that in a minute. That's the specific region or the Appalachian. In the Melville, it's the Santa Rita Hills. Uh, Robin has her Argentinian wine, Umboto Canal, 
Uh, the region, I believe, is Patagonia, which is we all know is the southern part of uh, South America. They share with Chile. And estate means that the grapes are all owned other by Umboto Canal. They don't buy grapes from other wineries. Peter Noir in the front layer. Uh, you got the Matua, which is the New Zealand one. Um, I believe uh, Kathleen got that as well. Marlboro, some of you might recognize Marlboro, New Zealand for uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, Matua also makes a very good Sauvignon Blanc. This happens to be their Pinot Noir. But again, Marlboro, if they wanted to be more spice, spice specific, they could say, you know, Vicente's Vineyard or you know, Vineyard of the Gods or something, but it means it's a particular plot of land. Here you've got the Chilean one, I believe that um, Robin had the Connoisseur, Southern Cone, that in Spanish, Southern Cone. Pinot Noir says Chile. Now that is an example of a non-regional wine, right? It, the grapes could have come from all over Chile. If it said, say, a, a typical region, like a typical region in Chile might be Apalta or it may be Casablanca or some others, and I'll show you in a minute, then you know the grapes came from a specific region. In this case, it was Chile. So that means the grapes could have come from anywhere in Chile. Uh, here you've got Oregon, which is where I live. Portland is right here on the tip. This is Washington State. So literally, Portland borders Washington State. And so there are two main regions, or three. You've got the Columbia Gorge, which is a warmer area, not so much Pinot Noir grown here. The Willamette Valley, which is predominantly Pinot Noir. And then Southern Oregon, the Umpqua and the Rogue Valley, they grow some warmer climate grapes like uh, Tempranillo, Zinfandel, Syrah. But this area, which is the largest wine region in Oregon, is um, where um, predominantly all the Pinot Noir is grown. And there's a river here um, called the Willamette River, uh, through the Willamette Valley, and you have the coastal range, the mountains here. So when the wind comes in, it kind of buffers these vineyards here because you've got some um, mountain ranges protecting um, that. But there are some winds that come through and it cools it at night. Uh, generally speaking, grapes love um, Sunny days and cool nights. Not so much heat, but sunny days, cool nights. So you have this coastal influence that comes in. Uh, um, it's not unabated um, because the mountains do ask as a protector. And for those of you that have been out here, you know if you want to drive from Portland to the coast, you got to drive over the mountain. It may only be an hour and a half drive, but you're going up and then you're going down. Um, so it's not flat. Um, so that is where we are in Oregon. Uh, the wine that I'm, that I'm having is a Portlandia, which is named after the television show. Um, and this particular wine comes from uh, the Dundee, Oregon, which is in between Portland and Salem here. Any of you been to Oregon or to Burgundy? If you have, please type it in the chat. I'd love to, uh, to have you tell us about that uh, uh, in a moment. Here we've got California. Um, and so the wines that Kathleen has, Melville, are primarily in the Central Coast area, if I'm not mistaken, Santa Rita Hills area, uh, which is not far from where Sideways was made. They also make it up here in the North Coast, which is the blow up over here. Sonoma, the Russian River, Carneros, they all make Pinot Noir in this part of the North Coast, and they also make it in the South Coast on these cooler regions along the coast. There's also some mountainous regions here near Monterey, Cupertino, those areas that they also make Pinot Noir. Not so much in the interior. This is kind of the Lodi, uh, warmer interior parts. This might be more suited for Cabernet and Zinfandel. Um, and not so much in the Sierra foothills either. Pretty warm over there. The South Coast, um, not so much um, Pinot Noir, but uh, there are some cooler areas down there as well. And uh, we've got the blow up of the Central Coast. Uh, this is that uh, area that Sideways was made. This is where Melville is around this area as well. You've got um, uh, some of the vineyard areas here. I believe uh, Sideways was made actually uh, in the Santa Barbara area and then they went up into Santa Maria um, and um, San Luis Obispo as well. Um, so that's a, that's a very popular area, cool, sunny during the day, cool in the evening. Australia, uh, um, Robin mentioned the limestone coast 
is generally this area here, north of Sydney. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong. Um, I spent some time in Victoria about 15 years ago in Melbourne. I went to see the, uh, they're working, but I also went to see the um, Australian Open and got to visit um, the Victoria, as well as I got to visit this southern area here called the Mornington Peninsula. But they grow Pinot Noir in various areas, particularly in the Adelaide region. Oh, Limestone Coast, here it is, sorry about that. South Australia, um, Limestone Coast, which is down here. Um, and then also in Western Australia near Perth, there's some cooler areas. So they grew Pinot Noir in several areas in Australia. Um, and here over New Zealand, you've got the Marlboro, the Matua that Kathleen had which is right here, which is the northern part of the south coast. But they make a lot of Pinot Noir down here in central Otago uh, as well. New Zealand generally, um, Pinot Noir is good on both islands, the North Island and South Island. They do make some warmer uh, grapes like um, Cab and Merlot, but they're probably having uh, more, they're probably more well known around the world for their Pinot Noir in addition to the Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, cooler climate, sunny days, cool nights. And then lastly, we're going to talk about Chile and Argentina. We can see Chile is right here, the spine of South America. These are the major regions. So I mentioned to you, when it says just Chile, it means that uh, it, the grapes could have been grown anywhere. But if it says Casablanca, which is White House, uh, uh, the White House Valley, uh, Aconcagua, which is the name of a river, uh, Maipo Valley, which is just outside Santiago, and then you've got uh, the Rappel, Curico and Maule Valleys. They actually go farther south as well, but this particular map shows the main white regions. And then Argentina, which is just over the border here from Chile, from Santiago, just over the border here, um, you've got the various regions. And the region that, um, that uh, Robin's Conosur comes from, uh, the Chilean one is down here, Patagonia, down here. But also Argentina, they've got some... Um, oh, Southern wines as well, uh, Patagonia and the Rio Negro, which is over here, which is the Black River. So all of these are wine growing regions. There's mountains here. You probably know the Andes Mountains are the highest mountains in the Western Hemisphere. And so, of course, if you're planting grapes at higher elevations, they're going to be cooler. You get sun during the day, then you get cool nights. So I want to just stop sharing for a moment and see if there's any questions in the chat. Or see if anybody wants to kind of uh, share. Uh, looks like uh, the connoisseur got a great rating. Um, Kathleen, type that in there. Uh, looks like it'd be fun to try the French Druin next to the Oregonian Druin. That's a good rating. Yeah, Ben, if I can just take a moment to say the, the, the Melville wines consistently get a, over 90 Robert Parker rating. So the, the one I'm trying tonight, the Santa Rita Hills one, is uh, they're one of their more moderately priced one, and it's a 94 Robert Parker rating. Actually, mm. one of them has a 95 rating that I'm saving for Thanksgiving. But um, Now, do you mind um, uh, sharing with the group where Melville's range of Pinot Noir prices are? So from 30 to 68. Okay, that's not yeah. bad. Yeah, so this was on their, 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 the, the lower side. But okay. the store that I bought for $15, and I've never tried a Chilean Pinot Noir before, for $15 and a Robert Parker 89 rating is keeping up just fine. Fantastic. I have nothing to say about the $12 New Zealand one. <laughs> <laughs> well, Pinot Noir is definitely one of those wines you, you, you get your money's worth. So if you pay more, you'll probably get more. Uh, if you pay less, it'll, it, it could be good, but um, you definitely get um, what you pay for there. Yeah. Anyone else want to share? I've got a question, Ben. So uh, we've loved, actually, it's been very fun to try these, these Pinot Noirs. And because I really was only familiar with the Oregon and the California. So really glad to try the French and the... Didn't, I didn't love the Australian, so I think Australia and New Zealand kind of go together, but our, our Argentinian one was good. But today is November 19th, and as my, in, my, in my history, that's the day that the Beaujolais Nouveau comes out, right? Mm -hmm. 
And I noticed that the Beaujolais was on the map in, the Bur in, in Burgundy. So how are these related? Great, big question. Um, so, um, two things. One is, you know, the, the French and the Americans are really smart when it comes to marketing, right? Um, when you think about wine and you think about why people buy certain wines and they label them a certain way and they market them a certain way, part of it is because, you know, for some people, um, you know, wine is really about the excitement of, of the moment or the excitement of an event. So about 30 years ago, there was um, a, a, an initiative put forth where they wanted to create some excitement around the Beaujolais grape, which is kind of an, uh, an everyday wine made from the Gamay grape. And what they came up with is they said, well, for the American market, Thanksgiving comes around and people get excited about food, wine, family, getting togethers. How about we create this kind of marketing campaign around um, this Gamay or Beaujolais grape? So they, they have a wine called Beaujolais Nouveau, which that means just new Beaujolais, but literally it's harvested um, in, you know, September and October, and they ship it via plane mostly to the United States. And it comes out the third Thursday of November every year. Um, now it's kind of a probably peaked already in terms of the popularity. I would probably say it's probably not as big a deal as it was before, but Beaujolais Nouveau is kind of this, for the wine world, it's kind of like this um, celebratory event where people um, go out and they buy uh, a 2020 Beaujolais Nouveau and um, they open it up and many times they have it with Thanksgiving because again, as you said, Robin, it's a week from today. So people will go out and buy it. Now, is it a particularly special or unique wine? No. I mean, it's just a new bottle of wine. It's made from the Gamay grape of France. Um, it's fermented just for a few weeks. It's not bottled in, excuse me, aged in oak. You're never going to find a, you know, a Beaujolais Nouveau that's aged for years and years. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of a refreshing, low um, alcohol, a low tannin wine. And, um, you know, it goes, you know, it goes back probably to, I mean, technically, you know, Beaujolais has been, organic has been grown, you know, since the 1800s, but it's probably um, in the 80s that the date was the third Thursday in November to take advantage of marketing for, you know, the Thanksgiving uh, weekend. So, um, no, 1980s. That, uh, yeah, so I, I put it in there, then they've got our number. It absolutely got our number. So that's interesting because that has been our Thanksgiving wine probably for 25 years. Unless it's a dry. And, and, and yeah, or it's a bad year. And you'll see it, as you said, Robin, you'll see it in the stores. A week ago, you probably didn't see it in the stores, but, you know, strict, probably coming in, you know, earlier this week, uh, you start seeing Beaujolais Nouveau in your wine shops, in your supermarkets, um, and you'll just start seeing cases and cases of it. And it doesn't have to be expensive, and it's a, it's a nice wine. You don't have to uh, uh, spend a lot of, a lot of wine. Um, and I would say that, you know, it's, it used to be, you know, people used to celebrate that third Thursday of November every year. Um, now it's probably not, uh, it's probably a little more muted than it had been. But great question. The wine is made from here. It's going to be made from the Gamay grape, and it's going to be labeled Beaujolais. And there's different categories. The Beaujolais Nouveau that we talked about is the one that comes on the third Thursday of November. But then you've got higher quality Beaujolais as well. Um, and that can be bought year round. And there's some Beaujolais um, that are, again, have different levels and can be more pricey and more expensive, all made from the AMA grape. So thank you for pointing that out. That's a good point. Interesting. Even though it's, it's a red burgundy. Yeah, even though it's I want to throw it out to the group. Um, I want to know what some of your traditions are from a food perspective. Uh, maybe the hurdles can uh, share with us what some of their Thanksgiving uh, food pairings are. What traditionally, I mean, how do they make the turkey? What kind of um, dishes do you have? Anything unique in dishes that oh. you make? What? Well, what we do actually is we start breakfast with mimosas. <laughs> mm. and, and then uh, it's sausage breakfast casserole. Mm. 
if it's just going to be us and the boys, we'll have like a chicken or chicken Swiss chicken casserole in the crock pot. We're mm -hmm. really turkey fans necessarily. So, Fine. but if you guys want the recipe, <laughs> it's so easy. So you need a crock pot. We, we're not giving the recipes. Yes, we are. Okay. Six chicken breasts. That and then, would be. No, six chicken breasts. And then on top of that, you layer 12 slices of Swiss cheese. On mm -hmm. You mix two cans of cream of mushroom, cream of celery, whatever you want, with a half a cup of milk. Mix that together, pour that on top. Then you're going to take two packages of uh, stovetop stuffing, pour that in, melt two sticks of butter, and drizzle that on top. Cook it for about 16 or about six hours, and you've got like the perfect Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> wow. I'm so glad this is being recorded because I believe <laughs> Meg and Jess are going to send out some recipes afterwards to the, everyone on the um, list. So don't be surprised if you get some people uh, emailing you guys asking for some, uh, some mm -hmm. hints as they, uh, as they make this. That's a great idea. Yeah. That I, I, is so, uh -huh. It's so simple. And every time I brought that to any kind of like – dinner, community dinner, church thing, it's, they, everybody requests it because it's, it's fabulous. It really does take, uh, taste like Thanksgiving. You can also substitute the chicken breast for any kind of turkey. If you have something that doesn't like chicken, but it is really good. I, I do have a question related to that. And that is the people are with turkey, um, whereas chicken is normally associated with usually a white wine. And I'm, I'm kind of curious to understand a little bit more about the relationship between a, a, a pinot noir and turkey because, you know, turkey is sort of close to chicken. Yeah, well, the French would tell you that turkey and chicken are fairly muted meats, right? Meaning in their natural state, just, you know, you buy a turkey or you buy a chicken and you just cook it. It doesn't have a great deal of flavor, right? You really have to spice it. You have to prepare it. You have to season it. So, so you know, many Europeans will say, well, you know, um, the reason why um, Pinot Noir goes with a, a meat like chicken or turkey is because it's versatile. It'll go with whatever you're making it with. Now, the other thing you have to be aware of is that Pinot Noir generally is not a wine that will overpower a food. So let's say you had a a turkey or chicken, and you had a Cabernet Sauvignon. Well, a Cabernet Sauvignon is a big wine, 14, 50% alcohol, a lot of tannin. So you take a bite of your turkey or chicken, you have a glass of the Cabernet, guess what you're going to be tasting? The Cabernet. With the Pinot Noir, you have some turkey or you have chicken. And if it's prepared reasonably, you know, not, you know, too spicy or, you know, over the top on seasoning, the Pinot Noir will generally um, complement the food versus being bigger than the food. I frankly think, Doug, that the reason why Pinot Noir is so popular at Thanksgiving is because the Pinot Noir producers know that that's the time of the year that people want to buy wine the most, right? More than Easter, more than July 4th, um, you know, and even more than, than, than New Year's, right? New Year's tends to be a champagne sparkling type of event. And so if you're going to buy wine, the Pinot Noir producers want you to do it really at Thanksgiving. And it's usually when people are thinking more about wine. Um, some people have Pinot Noir with ham as well. Um, Pinot Noir also, you know, is a wine that some people will have with lamb, although I would guess um, many people have either Syrah or Bordeaux, you know, a red wine with that. But I think it's part of it is um, happenstance. I think part of it is um, in the U.S., we are, um, you know, Thanksgiving is associated obviously with Turkey. And then by extension, the wineries want people to really start to um, look at certain types of wines as going with it. Now, Pinot Noir is not the only one. Um, certainly, um, there's whites and reds. Uh, a white that comes to mind would be Gewürztraminer. Um, um, it has a little spice to it. And many times, turkey dishes have spice to it. But... Um, there are, you know, other wines, Zinfandel, some people might go with, particularly, let's say, if it's a grilled, um, you know, so grilled uh, turkey might have a little bit more kind of that barbecue smoky thing going on. So, um, and or if your turkey is caramelized, 
then you might, you know, go more for a, uh, a fruitier, you know, more upfront fruit like a Zin or a Syrah or even a Cabernet. But um, Pinot Noir tends to be that kind of nice balance. Uh, it's not too heavy, good alcohol, um, and the, that earthen kind of flavor goes with the earthen dishes of, of the fall. I don't know if that helps, but that's kind of, uh, that's kind of my, uh, my, my take on it. That's, that's I'm good. curious for the both of you and your family, when did you get away from Turkey um, and move to chicken? I guess um, when it really became sort of more of an empty nest. Okay. Yeah, I don't want him sleeping. Big, huge turkey. <laughs> well, that's definitely understandable. Um, anyone else want to share? Uh, how about the McGee's? Can you share us what uh, you folks have for Thanksgiving and how do you make it? And do you have any unique or family dishes? And much to Meg's to my or disappointment, my family never had um, mashed potatoes, and because my mother always made um, a stuffing from potatoes, which was bad, which <laughs> Meg never liked. <laughs> and now that my mom is gone, I miss that stuffing, but I don't really have great memories of it. But <laughs> no, Jim makes a good stuffing now with sausage yeah, and artichokes in it. Delicious. Well, unfortunately, most of our Thanksgiving dinners of the past 15 years have consisted of box <laughs> wine. So we're excited this year to have our own Thanksgiving with good wine. Mm. Well, the, the Jim shares with me are usually pretty impressive wines. So maybe his uh, his palate has become uh, a little more sophisticated with age. Well, where we go for Thanksgiving isn't. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll be home and get to do whatever we want. So we're looking okay. forward to that. Well, if I was back in Connecticut where I grew up, my mom likes Kanai wine. Um, <laughs> the reason why you don't know it because it costs about $3. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, and it usually comes in peach or apricot. Uh, so uh, it's not exactly um, the highest end wine, but um, hey, to each his own, right? right. So um, that's what she drinks. Uh, I don't consider it wine, but because um, if it says peach on it, how could it be? <laughs> it's a fruit wine. But, yeah, fruit wine. Yeah, fruit, 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 fruit wine. Here. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But, you know, it's better than nothing and it has a little alcohol in it. So it, <laughs> sometimes you need that's that. what you need. It does the job. How about uh, Rita? Rita, do you have any special foods or um, dishes that you either grew up with or that maybe you've made or families made over the years? I'm glad you added the part about grew up with because I am a great Thanksgiving guest. I usually look to see <laughs> who's cooking so I can show up with the wine. <laughs> <laughs> my background, my parents are both were both from the South. So yes, we had turkey. We always had sweet potatoes, always had collard greens, mac and cheese. My mother makes the best made the best sweet potato pie, but never gave me her recipe. However, if I do bake something, I do bake a lemon meringue pie from scratch to die mm. for. To absolutely die for. So if you like lemon meringue pie and I'm in your area, I'm happy to make one and bring it. My KitchenAid might go through shock when I take the cover off, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> It'll say, oh, she's going to use us. <laughs> so I like showing up with the wine and the dessert. Well, you know, dessert, you know, and wine um, do have a place too, because if you think about it, you know, Thanksgiving is not just the main meal, right? It's also the desserts. And so some people will bring dessert wine to Thanksgiving, right? Um, uh, and that could be anything from, you know, uh, sometimes folks will like a port or sherry. Um, you know, you're sitting down and maybe, you know, after your stomach is full and you're sitting on that proverbial couch or the recliner and you're starting to get really comfortable and then you have a little glass of something that goes with the pumpkin pie or the so a lot of dessert wine uh, is consumed around Thanksgiving and Christmas as well. Um, obviously, the Pinot Noirs aren't, aren't you know, uh, dessert wines, but oftentimes you can buy a, a half a bottle or a 375 of a dessert wine and have that with, uh, with your dessert. Or sometimes the dessert wine is dessert, right? It's, it's, it's kind of the dessert in and of itself. 
Um, I will so, say I didn't come to appreciate Port until the Bryant alumni trip to Portugal because we went to where to the vineyards and to where they made Port and it was absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, that's a beautiful place. I managed to go there myself and uh, it, 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 um, the memories are, are great. It's just a beautiful part of Portugal. And uh, we don't drink enough port or dessert wine in this country, uh, Rita. And I think it's because, number one, it's, you know, it's sugary, high alcohol. Uh, for many of us, um, you know, you drink it during the week. It, it's, it's a big wine. Um, you're not going to finish the bottle in one night. And it's almost like a special occasion. But we should do it uh, more often um, because I just feel like it's a lot of great dessert wine. Almost every country in the world makes dessert wine. So Italy, they, you know, they often call it Vino Santo. Um, in France, they've got lots of dessert wine, not the least of which is probably Sauternes, is probably the most famous that's made in Bordeaux. In Germany, they make lots of dessert wine, particularly from Riesling in Spain. Uh, you, many of you know Sherry you know, all kinds of um, dessert wine from, from Sherry. Portugal, you mentioned port. In the U.S., we make lots of late harvest wines. In Australia, they, they make wines, uh, they call them stickies. They're dessert wines as well. So uh, probably underappreciated and underconsumed. Um, but that's a great idea, bringing a, a nice bottle of wine to a get-together or, or uh, either a dessert wine or a regular wine um, to uh, your event. I'm curious, Jay, what traditions you grew up with from a Thanksgiving perspective? Oh yeah, thanks, Vin. Um, my Thanksgivings, I grew up in Albany, New York, and we spent every Thanksgiving in Newburgh, which is about halfway between Albany and New York City, um, with, uh, with one branch of our family and probably 30 people there every year. It was wonderful. Uh, the, we, we, it was a very traditional Thanksgiving dinner. We had turkey and stuffing and you know, nothing really out of the ordinary. One thing I would say is that my dad always made uh, pickles and I actually make pickles now and we make them very, very spicy. So uh, pickling, you would, you basically, you take the, you take smaller cucumbers, put them in a glass jar, add dill, pickling spices, kosher salt, um, some chopped uh, uh, garlic. And I might be missing one ingredient, but the secret sauce to what we did is we would take about a quarter of a cup of um, maybe even a half a cup if we were getting bold of uh, pepper flakes, like you'd put on pizza, you know, mm. and, and put that in there and then fill it with water, seal the jar up and you'd sit, you'd set it for about 20 days or so. And every night, every day, every night, you'd have to tip the jar the other way. So everything would get, you know, equally um, pickling, pickled. And, uh, and oh man, were they great. Really? Uh, but I, I do have one, one funny memory of, of Thanksgiving that I'll share. You were talking about, I think Rita was talking about uh, pumpkin pie. And um, one year we were after dinner uh, sitting at the table. My dad and I were sitting at the table and all the, there was three or four or five pies and um, everybody else was out just doing their own thing. And my aunt came in and started cutting the pies and she, for dessert. So she's, she would, <laughs> she would cut a pot, cut a piece of pie and lift it off with her hand onto the plate. And then she would lick her fingers and then she would go put another one in. And, you know, and I'm looking at this, I'm almost cracking up and I'm, I'm looking at my dad and he, I could see just the horror on his face. And <laughs> so my aunt says, she yells out to just to anybody in general, does anybody want pie? <laughs> my, dad, my dad looks at me and goes, not anymore. <laughs> I'll never forget that memory. <laughs> that is so funny. That is so funny. Uh, so I imagine when you're cutting pie in your household, uh, there's no licking of the of the fingers, is there? You know, some that's it, it's just so personal. Some people don't mind that. Some people are completely grossed out about it. I would never touch a piece of pie that somebody did that to ever. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of like that Friends episode. No, no, no. Was it Seinfeld? The double dip. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. The dip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I have to. I have to come in here and thank Jay right now. Four years ago, and we talked about this early for those of you who are on. 
we played Northwestern in basketball the day after Thanksgiving, right? Right. And so Newell and I were going to be in Chicago on Thanksgiving. And Jay didn't bat an eyelash. He said, we've got 18. What's two more? <laughs> and so in, in 2016, luckily, we were all on the same side of the fence. <laughs> We had we had Thanksgiving dinner with your family, and it was just a, one of our favorite memories and a wonderful, wonderful day. And, uh, great and I think you and your you and his dad hit it off. Oh yeah, so, uh, I grew up in upstate New York, uh, just west of uh, Albany. So uh, we we have that landscape in common. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but you know that's what Thanksgiving does. It brings people together. We, I'm sure everybody will be like that. It'll be four of us for Thanksgiving this year. Last year, it was only five. One of the students from Bryant from Hong Kong ate Thanksgiving dinner with us. And he ate everything down to the bones of that wow. turkey. <laughs> wow. We're not gonna miss that, but. <laughs> <laughs> there weren't many leftovers, sounds like Robin. There was much, not much leftover. There was nothing for the compost, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> Great story. Great story. Wow. Uh, Sharon, I wonder if Sharon, you could t tell us a little bit about any Thanksgiving traditions that um, you and your family have. Just unmute yourself if you can. Or can you unmute them, Meg? Or, or thing, can you unmute? There you go. Sharon, tell us a little bit about Thanksgiving at your home over the years. Um nothing particularly special my mother used to make pecan pie which is to die for um mm. and i did on the chat post that we've been using old bay as a uh, what do you call it on the turkey oh, skin the seasoning seasoning and then we grill it we've been you grill it you have a weber grill uh, we started with a kettle grill now we have a gas grill but it wow. looks the same so you put the whole turkey inside the grill. Yep. Take up to twenty-two pounds. Yep, and it's it's much more to me. It's much more moist. I don't know whether it's the old bay or the grill, but wow. it, and it frees up oven space for everything else. I've always wanted to do yeah, that. I'm going to try it, Sharon. Thanks for the suggestion. <laughs> I've never had a grill big enough to put a turkey in. No, we do that too. We do that too every year. We've done it for a couple of forever. decades, forever. forever. We, yeah, use, yeah. We, we use a Weber. We have something a little different from a Weber, but it's a kettle grill, right? Yeah. Is that what you do, Sharon? Yeah. You, you put it in there, you put the lid on, and you do not open it up. <laughs> and well, uh, we, you know, we, get, we get anxious because <laughs> one year I had to call my cousin an hour early and say, the turkey's done. You need to get here now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's, it, it is great. It, it opens up the oven. And um, I, the only thing we miss is that smell of turkey inside the house. But all you have to do is go outside and it's outside. <laughs> How long is it taking the grill generally? Um, oh, it's fast, right, Sharon? Well, it I mean, depends on the weather, because I think if it's really cold, then outside the grill is so cold and it might take longer. Yeah, makes a, makes a yeah, a couple hours. We did it. We did a chicken the other night, one of those oven roasted in the, and it was done in like an hour. One we were hour. we were amazed. But um, the only thing with that, you need like a pop up because you look through a, with a flashlight through the hole to see if it's done. <laughs> so you can kind of look inside. Yeah. yeah. See what's but going it's, on. It's a good way. But Sharon, I'll try the old bay. I haven't tried that, so that'll that be good. Great. It's great. <laughs> One year, my sister you, did dinner and forgot it, and I said, "You forgot the old bay." <laughs> you gotta have it. You gotta have it. Hey, I know we're coming up on some time here. Uh, I'm curious, Leo, uh, what you've done from a Thanksgiving perspective over the years. Well, if uh, we're not at the Lone's house enjoying it, there's we have a uh, what's called a big green egg as a smoker. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Inside. And we've done the, uh, we've smoked, it takes about eight hours, sometimes seven hours, and we don't open it. Yeah. Um, and what ironic about that, when Rita makes a soup uh, after the carcass is pretty well gone, uh, you can still take the, taste the smoke taste. So mm -hmm. we use regular hot chocolate, not, not the, the bag stuff, and then we pick wood chips to, uh, that 
we smoked the wood chips and then that wood, it could be pecan, it could be apple. Uh, one of my favorite wood chips is, is uh, uh, Jack Daniel whiskey barrels uh, that they chop up and use them because that gives you a flavor that can take your nose down. Wow. Now, seriously, the first time you used the, the green egg, I mean, did you make a mistake? Did you know already what you were doing? Because I always worry the first time I'm doing it, am I going to make a mistake? Or do I need to make it maybe, you know, beforehand? Or I, I was, I'm just curious, did you get it right, right off the bat? How about the first five times? <laughs> okay. That's music to my ears. Yeah, it, it, it takes a while, yeah. And we keep notes, uh, obviously, because we'll do ribs or we'll do uh, other things. And we'll say, how did we do that? Are we going to tent? We're not going to tent. Are we going to uh, base? We're not going to base. Uh, so, and, he, and even putting the wood chips on the charcoal, uh, I used to put it on ahead of time, and then I read something because I subscribed to a, a, a great, big green egg uh, monthly gen, uh, journal, and rather than get the coals going first, and then with these soaked wood chips, put them on after instead of while you're lighting it, and it seems that then that by that time the temperature, temperature is, is up to up on we want it on, on the big, big green egg. And then you, it, you get the full smoking that versus uh, losing it because because the, the the meat or whatever this is not in there. Slow so, and low is the way. To slow go. and low. So wow! Can you, I just can I just say I hear the seeds of an early summer next uh, uh, Zoom event or maybe maybe hybrid. Some of us get to gather in person event, but I want some grill master tips. I want to know when to baste or not baste. I want to know. When, yeah, why? I, 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 I want to spend more time with Leo and I want to spend some more time learning about different growing techniques. Sounds good to me. It sounds like Leo and Sharon and her family need to do a little demo uh, yeah. with the turkey and the big green well, egg. Grill off. <laughs> Yes, yes, I, well, I want to do it. We yes. celebrate Thanksgiving together, so. <laughs> that would be so wonderful. We, we'll do it for Christmas, too. Yeah, you know, uh, when I was growing up, we talked about desserts and things like that. And I even never shared this with Rita, but when we were growing up, there was three of us. I had two sisters. And if there was a cake or there was a pie that was cut and it was on the table in the middle and we were still finishing our dinner, we would wet our finger and touch the piece we wanted. <laughs> and then my sisters, or I, we would never touch that piece because it's already been contaminated. <laughs> <laughs> and my mother being, I like, love being it. Like, I too happy about that conduct. I'm with you, Leo. I remember once I put my, my spoon in a dish and it was on top of the, I don't know, it was on top of a pot or, you know, I put it in the pot and my mom was like, we got to throw the whole thing out. And I was like, really? I said, I couldn't believe it, but she was always into making sure, maybe because we had guests over, so I took something out of that, and she was not too happy. So uh, so that was uh, fortunate. Anyone else like to share? Uh, I know we're going to be wrapping up shortly. I want to share their uh, thinking, uh, either traditions or, or memories uh, uh, as we wrap up. I'll share one real quick. Uh, every year, you all from Connecticut know that there's a uh, there's a marathon they call the Manchester Road Race. And in, in 1989, I decided I was going to run the Manchester Road Race on Thanksgiving morning. And needless to say, uh, I did not come in first. I did not come in second. I did not come in third. I did not come in 500th. <laughs> I think I came in and people were already eating Thanksgiving dinner when I finished. So um, running was not my thing, but uh, but I think, you know, everyone gets excited on Thanksgiving. They get up in the morning and they go run. And so I did that. And um, and so I'll never forget. Um, I just I walked in and it was like everyone is already eating. And, and meanwhile, I'm just uh, dead. <laughs> I, I couldn't breathe. So uh, Manchester Road Race. Uh, uh, I'm not sure they're holding it this year, but uh, but it's been held every year for many, many years. So with that, um, what do we think, Kathleen? Should we uh, maybe uh, have a toast? Um, if anyone has yeah. any more comments, you got to unmute Robin. 
You want to get a picture? Did we get a picture? That's a great idea. I'll pour a little more of the French. Does everybody have a wine, some wine in their glass so we can yeah. take a little toast? All righty. Oh, no. All right. All so, right. So, so Meg, I'm hoping you're getting the picture. Meg, yeah. <laughs> I have my I have a camera too, so oh, I'm gonna. Um, she can do a screen grab, which is yeah. Bad. She can do. She oh, that's true. That's look true. At us, that's look true. at us, Ben. That's good. Thank okay. you. Here we go. One, two, three. Cheers. 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 Thank you. to all of you. <laughs> look great, guys. Thank you. Good. Mm. I needed I needed a picture for the next issue of Engage. So. <laughs> Well, I took a couple right. of two, uh, Robin. A good, good. Anyone else like to share before we wrap up? I think we can share the chat, right, Kathleen? The chat from today will be saved with us. Yep. With, so um, there are some great tips here. So we'll be able to share that with everyone who, who is here today. And okay, we, I know we had some people who couldn't be there. What, what wonderful ideas. So what a great night. Thank you so much. Thanks, Vin. Thanks, Vin. This is really Thank great. Thank you all yeah. for coming. Thank have a much. wonderful Thank and you. safe Thanksgiving. Cheers. Yeah, everybody have a great, safe Thanksgiving. Bye -bye. Safe Thanksgiving. Bye -bye. Right. Thank we'll see you, you soon. Bye, -bye. Bye guys. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye, Sherry. Thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? <laughs> Many people there. <laughs> Happy <laughs> holidays, everyone. Bye, Rita. Bye. I'm glad you could make it. Take care. Yeah, we've got the whole recording. You can see the beginning. Great. Bye. 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 Uh, how can you?